Welcome to Slow and Steady, the podcast where you get to follow along as we build products in public. Each week, we'll give you an honest peek into our lives as we share our struggles, our wins, and everything in between. I'm Benedicta, and I'm feeling hopeful. And I'm Benedict. Today is October 11th. This is episode number 155, and I'm feeling a lot better, but super annoyed by my internet connection. Yeah, I was just going to say, you might feel better, but this interconnect <laughs> internet connection is not feeling good. Um, I think I counted like five seconds between my intro and when I heard your part of the intro. So this can this can be fun. This will be an interesting conversation. <laughs> but yeah. better from what? I got COVID. I actually might still have it. I haven't tested myself recently. So I did not get to meet you last week, like we promised everyone. Yeah, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, but yeah, nothing we can do about it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Except that I thought we were over. I thought we were done. But anyway, let's not uh, dwell on that. I did get to meet Miriam. Um, she took the train out to Heidelberg and we had a really good brunch, lunch, and talked about all kinds of stuff and even forgot to take a picture. So I'm not sure if it even happened. It's not on Twitter. Like, did it happen? I don't know. Uh, existential crisis here but um i remember it as being very nice <laughs> that's nice <laughs> did we ever did we ever talk yeah. about miriam on this podcast so, do people know about miriam i'm not sure maybe we didn't i met miriam at rur js in 2019 i think yeah 2019 and then i kind of just kept in touch with her on on the internet and then last christmas we did a session of streams with her because her side project is conference buddy which is a super cool project where like conference buddy helps new people you know feel comfortable at conferences or new conference goers feel comfortable at conferences um and we helped her build out the website in gatsby on our stream so i got to know her a little more and then it turns out you know her as well yeah yeah i mean she's living nearby i guess it's not that we see each other often but used to have like mutual friends and met because of that i guess yeah have you ever um gone to a conference where they had a conference buddy boot i have not um th that might also be because they have i haven't been to a conference in like three years <laughs> i will nobody has <laughs> Yeah, yes, her project kind of took took a little bit of a backseat during, um, you know, during COVID. Um, but she was in Berlin, I think, last week, had a conference booth at the View conference there and kind of getting back into the groove of things. And um, we talked a little bit about, you know, how she could, um, what she could do. And also that I realized while we were talking about conferences, how passionate I actually am about giving people a good conference experience. I didn't realize until after we had that talk on the podcast i was like i actually care about this <laughs> um so i talked to miriam a little bit about that and um you know if i could be like a conference buddy ambassador and, and go to conferences and just welcome newcomers that would be awesome yeah that's an awesome um, way to but yeah we'll see so what else has, been, what comes out of has that. been going on what you've been up to yeah i was about to ask you the same thing <laughs> 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 As I said it, I heard you say it like this, like you go first. I'm going to be quiet until you start talking now. Okay, cool. Um, well, what happened last week, uh, except for getting COVID, uh, we finally deployed uh, mes message composer changes, uh, both front end and back end to production. It's behind the feature flag. Unfortunately, both on front end Yay. and back end, introducing the feature flag required us to touch a lot of old stuff as well. Um, so we that did, did a lot of testing that even with the feature flag turned off stuff would still work. Um, and we deployed it and it didn't break the old stuff. <laughs> so I'm happy about that. And, um, this week we are switching on for, for people, um, starting with a handful who requested early access, and then we're probably going to roll it out in like percentages over the next week or two. And, um, it's great. Like, I'm so happy that it's done. I mean, there's still a few more things to do, like small stuff, but like the majority of the work is done. And I, even though I got COVID on Friday, it felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders to have this uh, out of the way and deployed and like 
not hanging over my head anymore. So that was a yeah, welcome change, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm gonna miss hearing about the progress on the message composer. You do? I, I'm I'm not like I don't I will not miss basically telling people every week that there has been any like meaningful progress. <laughs> but I guess there will be a couple more like <laughs> now that we basically replaced everything we had before, like with something that was like has feature parity. And now we're like planning to add a little bit more fluff on top of it. So it's actually worth to announce like to announce it like with like a little bit of a better feature set. It's not entirely clear what what that will going to look like and what exactly we're going to add, but nothing about like adding stuff like embedding videos in the emails or um, embedding testimonials a little bit nicely nicely styled with images and stuff like that, or embedding tweets in the email emails. Um, stuff like that is on the roadmap uh, and. We're probably going to do this in the next couple of weeks as well. And then once that is in there, actually make a little bit of a marketing push and um, add a dedicated feature page to the website, announce it to the, the mailing list and stuff like that. But before we do all of that, we wanted to yeah, get the current version replaced with a new one and um, get it yeah, up and running and tested and then build on the new foundations. You could do like you could do a marketing push for everything you do. Like now you can do tweets. Now you can do the videos. Now you can do even if you end up with the same code for all of them, you could be like announcing them separately. We we'll definitely do a little bit of that on Twitter. I don't think it's worth like launching it to the mailing list separately. I, well, I mean there's an argument for doing it, but also I don't want to annoy everyone with like, oh here's this little thing and here's that little thing, and I don't know, it feels a little bit too overwhelming but um yeah i mean you got a point you don't want to kind of annoy people a little bit no <laughs> i don't know you shouldn't annoy people kind of on purpose if they do feel annoyed but i've kind of realized a little bit over the, the years like doing all kinds of side projects and and different things it's like it takes a while for people to to get the message and they don't see everything you post or everything you email even and and being able to kind of repeat yourself but in a way where it's not just a complete repeat is good yeah i agree it can be good i guess we should at least make a habit out of like building a library of like small features like that like if we add like one more thing to the, the message editor like just add it to an internal feature library so um when we know we when we need something to post on twitter or for the next newsletter or something like that we can just like pick something and included as a little side note because we're definitely doing that thing you recently mentioned what brian castle is doing in his newsletter like just promoting something that's already deployed and already there not necessarily something yeah. new so we're definitely doing that and maybe just building a library for that is a good idea and um adding each of those small features one by one it's probably the way to go it's so interesting because you kind of forget it at least i've when i've done projects it's like you you manage to overcome all of these hurdles or make these features. And and then when you're done, you're kind of like, you, f you forget yeah. that it took quite an effort and you have something to say about it or something to market about it because then you're like, message composer done, moving on, while nobody else has, been mo has moved on. Like it's new to them, but you're sick of it already. And it's so easy then to just, both kind of forget to talk about or like build in public, like talk about the issues you had and also the marketing side of like both sides of it, just talking yeah. about things that you found hard and like how you sold it. And then also market all of the, the things that came out of it because you're like so done in, in your own mind while nobody else was like part of that journey inside of your mind. Well, we've been part of your what five week journey with this, <laughs> this composer. Um, but more like eight or 12. <laughs> but still, your customers probably haven't been. Yeah, but your customers haven't, right? And and Twitter haven't really. And and um, and yes, yeah, so it's, it's worth reminding ourselves and having a system for that sounds really cool that you'll have a little kind of library of things that you can touch upon. And you can even touch upon it in a year. Like, do you know we, yeah, like we've talked about before, like, do you know you can embed so-and-so? And do you know? Yeah. Um, so that's cool that you're getting some some internal systems for that. 
And I think one key part is also just breaking it down. Like, because yeah, like for sure in our, like, um, in our minds, like the message composer is just one big thing and it's like one self-contained feature, but in itself, it has like so much smaller stuff that we tend to brush over and forget, for example, all the keyboard shortcuts we added, all the copy paste features we added, for example, the thing you suggested with like selecting text and then uh, copy pasting a link on it doesn't replace the text anymore, but makes it a link and stuff like that. So it's easy to forget that those are all features that we can, in theory, talk about and mention and uh, promote. Um, and they all fall in that big bucket of message composer, but they're like useful bits of knowledge in themselves. And also ones that lend themselves to little videos or GIFs, like GIFs, GIFs. I'm never going to get this done, <laughs> but uh, did I get this down? But like Steve Ruiz did with his TL Draw, you know, because his, his app is lends itself so well to like visual little videos showing off the off the interactions and i think also for your composer even though it's not as visually pleasing as a drawing app it's still you can make a little like gif of doing that copy pasting like magic you know it just works as as you expect it to and and those will grab people's attention more than trying to write about it it's it's not a very catchy paragraph but a little little demo would be quite powerful i think totally yeah well yeah given uh we are done with that project the other thing i was working on last week um is we finally changed the subdomain we use for opening click tracking which sounds like a ridiculous change uh, but we noticed that um we had previously we had track.userlistmail.com and apparently a couple of like firewall and antivirus and anti-tracking software um, detected the track and redirected calls to that domain to something else. And um, we got a lot of people, well, a lot of people, not that many, but a couple of people complaining to their, um, the companies they are receiving emails from that the links don't work. And it took us a while to figure out what was going on. And after jumping on a couple of calls, with people, we noticed that it's actually something on their machine or in their network that's redirecting uh, DNS lookups for those domains. Um, and now we changed it, and it's now link.userlistmail.com, hoping that that won't trigger like privacy blocking stuff on people's machines. So, yeah, it was a more difficult ch of a change than we anticipated. <laughs> But so, what's the use case? Like the machine inter intercepts the tracking link and then just sends them to nowhere. Yeah, but what happens is because we use an HTTPS connection, so it's encrypted. So they redirect the DNS lookup usually to a local host, and then local host doesn't have the correct certificate installed um, for track.userlistmail.com. So usually, people get in their browser get a yeah, like SSL certificate invalid error and uh, yeah, just can't open the page. Huh. What kind of software does this? I don't know the or names, but it was it was like some like popular antivirus software that was it Bitdefender or something like that. I don't I don't remember what it was exactly, but it's apparently oh, okay, like a privacy okay. feature of a lot of those like security suites that you can buy. And I guess in a way mm. it makes sense. And I'd even argue yeah. everything is working like it should. Like they installed the software. It shouldn't, like it wants to protect them from getting tracked. So therefore, of course, the tracking link shouldn't work. Um, but from a user experience standpoint, <laughs> um, yeah. it's not as nice, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and we covered that before. Like people want privacy and then they don't understand the implications of privacy. Yeah. Which then makes the support on you to explain to them why their privacy choices have the effects on the usability that they have. Um, and I'm wondering if that will ever go away. It will never go or, away. Or, ooh, segue, <laughs> if that, that is one of those hard problems. <laughs> <laughs> like trying to explain the, the privacy implications to, to users who are not that into tech is always just going to be, yeah, just going to be a hard thing to do. Yeah. And I mean, but. that's 
you had a run into another problem as well. Uh, I ran into a couple of problems. I mean, as I said, like having that big project lifted off our shoulders allowed me to spend some time looking into other issues. Um, and the other interesting issue we fixed last week was uh, with our Luby, um, Luby, Ruby integration and Ruby on Rails integration, uh, we ship a, a rake task, which is basically like a make task or whatever. Like it's a command you can run to import all the users in your application's database into user list. And when we built this a couple of years ago, it was just working fine, no problems. Um, but as we got like bigger customers, we started noticing a problem where that import of like a couple thousand um, users would just like stop or break in the middle of it. And usually with like weird timeout issues relating to the TCP connection. And it didn't like, I mean, sure, the, the internet is broken by default. Like there's always something that doesn't quite work. So retries and all of that is a good idea most of the time. But in this particular case, it was super weird because it always happened like after a couple of thousand of imported users. And then afterward, it was like be super persistent and sticky and like even start making problems earlier on. And it wasn't until last week where I realized that what's happening is probably that each of those imports triggers a separate HTTP request to our servers. And Heroku at some point is probably saying something like, okay, you send us like 5,000 requests in the last 20 seconds. You're probably trying to bring us down. And therefore, we're not accepting anything new from you and just like <laughs> ignoring the entire thing. And for a while last week, I was like, okay, how do we get around this? Should we like add some sort of batch endpoint way or bulk endpoint where you can send instead of like one user per request, send us like a hundred users per request. And then I was like, okay, but like how does response code, like HTTP response code relate to that? Because suddenly like, you, do you want it to fail if like just one record of the hundred is invalid? Is then the entire request invalid? Or... Like mm. something like that. So I was thinking about that. And to be honest, I haven't found like a solution that I like. I mean, there have been workarounds like like returning an array with like status codes for like each record and stuff like that. But it all it, it all feels like a weird hack and doesn't really match with HTTP semantics. So at some point I was like starting to question like why is this why is this even a problem? Why can't I do like multiple HTTP requests. It's not that weird of a thing to do. And at some point I realized it's the TCP, like the underlying TCP connection that is failing at some point. And then after looking at our code, I realized that we're not using HTTP Keeper Live. So we were literally for every single request opening TCP connection to the servers, doing the HTTP request, getting a response back, closing the TCP connection, and then for the next one, opening a new TCP connection, sending the request, getting a response, closing the TCP connection. So the problem wasn't necessarily that Heroku was blocking HTTP requests. It was blocking TCP connections. Um, and it turns out like a one-liner fixed that, and um, now our race library is actually reusing <laughs> the TCP connection. Um, so basically the default setting is if it's idle for like more than two seconds, it will close it. But if you send another request within those two seconds, it will yeah. just reuse the connection and keep going. And therefore we can send like a thousand requests via one TCP connection and it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> uh, but it's one of those things where I felt wow. too close to Wow, <laughs> way to... I was a way to go on the debugging. Like I feel like this is... Like, this is a little bit back to when we're talking about, like, senior dev or not. Like, I think you would have jumped on one of those earlier solutions if you hadn't had, like, you said you had, like, a feeling that, you know, that wasn't why the problem was a problem. And you kept it, like, kept it in the back of your mind. Or I don't know if you were actually sitting down and coding while you did this, but then suddenly the solution appeared. Did it appear like in the shower or on the walk or something or actually in front of the computer? It was actually in front of the computer, but it was while... Basically, I was unhappy with all the solutions I came up with like on the HTTP layer where I felt like this 
Yeah. Like HTTP obviously isn't made for this where you can like it should be one request per 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 user and like per response and like mm-hmm. it's built that way. So why is it why is it not working? And that started me thinking about okay, is there something else? Like for example, I was thinking uh, Heroku only does HTTP one dot one, I guess. And these days we have HTTP two and HTTP three mm-hmm. even. And I know they do like some clever stuff in terms of multiplexing and stuff. Like so they can do a lot of parallel requests via one connection. So I, at some point I was like, okay, maybe I, maybe we have to switch off of Heroku to be able to use those new, newer protocols that support all of that stuff. Until I realized, hey, HTTP one or one dot one has this keep alive thing. Maybe maybe that's already what we want. And after looking at the code of the um, Ruby library we were using to do the HTTP requests, I realized my mistake where there's a way in there to basically open the TCP connection and then doing multiple requests over the same connection. And I wasn't using that. So in the end, the solution was to tell the thing, hey, open the connection and keep it open instead of opening it and closing it with every single request you're making. Um, and I still have to hear back from a couple of our customers who were running into this problem, but I'm fairly confident that we fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes, sometimes the kind of yeah, the correct solution is just like it. It's so much simpler than all of the other solutions, or it just like falls into place. You've talked about it before, like with you know data models, like often when you're having like running into these issues again and again with like the the front end or the back end even just becoming complex you're like oh it's it's further down in the the layers the problem actually is because it's it's hindering hindering whatever we're trying to do further up um but it's hard to know and i think it takes a lot of experience to know where to go looking for the solution or when to stop looking for solutions and when to keep looking for solutions. Like, what is a good enough? Yeah. Existential <laughs> questions these are. <laughs> totally. But um, but it's cool to hear about you, like, talk through it, because you actually went through a lot of iterations and trying to look for different solutions, and then you landed on something that just, like, oh, wow, this is too easy, <laughs> kind of. It's almost like it's too easy to be true. Is this all I have to do? And that's often the correct like often the the good and correct solution is the easiest solution not the like super convoluted kind of like hacks are always convoluted right or usually convoluted. yeah yeah um i feel like not being satisfied with a solution because it's too hard or too complicated or too convoluted is actually a good metric to to think about solutions um and at least for me like if i think if i'm working on something and it it doesn't feel right and it's like too hard and too hard to do i usually take it as a sign that i'm missing something or there's more information that i need or i'm looking at the wrong thing or thinking about it in the wrong way so i guess sometimes if it's too hard taking a step back and looking for something else or like looking for a higher level concept i guess is the way to go um because i i don't want to deal with hard stuff i don't i want to deal with easy stuff i guess <laughs> <laughs> but i also feel like if you kind of understand what a certain framework is made or technology is made to to solve, like you were like, well, HTTP is meant to solve this. Like it's meant to be used this way. So it shouldn't need like a hard or com- like complex way to deal with it because this is what it's made for. And I think you can think like that on every level. Like this database, like I picked this database because of X. So then X should be quite easy to do with this. But maybe Y is something it's not known for. So there I might need, you know, some some weirder solutions. Or like higher layer level, like I work with Gatsby. It's like Gatsby was made to solve, you know, creating static sites. So if my site isn't being statically generated and doesn't work without JavaScript, like I've done something really hacky to make that happen. <laughs> like, because if you're using it like it should be, then um, yes, yeah, so it's always good to kind of think about what the technology, what the framework like wants you to do, because then your solutions are often much more like, yeah, simpler solutions if you kind of follow, I don't know, follow the path of the framework. <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> I'm like, getting into existential trying... territory all the time here. 
and even if you're trying to do something that like in like if it's something that fits with the framework and fits with the thing it's solving but it still feels like it's too hard like i feel like some uh, a lot of times you're just using it wrong and like maybe thinking about it wrong and most often than not there's an easier solution because that's how it's supposed to like it's solving that problem you're just like trying to use it in the wrong way and if you just look a little bit left and right and maybe read read up on the darks you might find a way or an api endpoint that does exactly the thing you want instead of like having to come up with your own solution that's super weird i think it often comes from if you are used to one way of working or one framework or technology and then you kind of want another one to work the same way then you often end up kind of making complex solutions to get that one framework to look like another framework and that is yeah. never a good way to go because then somebody else comes in and going to work in this project they look at the doc for that technology or that framework and they're like oh this is how you know this looks this looks good and then you go into the code base and like nothing is done in the same way as the documentation or other projects you've done with that technology and you're like but but I can't like now I have to map another framework on top of this framework to understand what the last developer did because yeah. it's not using like any of of that frameworks or technologies best practices i saw somebody on twitter said that like going back to some really old ruby on i i have almost no ruby on rails experience but the tweet was about at ruby on rails and he said whenever he came, comes back to code that just like follow the straight up recommendations it was so easy to go back and do changes and upgrades but yeah. wherever he had tried to be like clever and like trying out some new kind of paradigm or something, but on t on top of Ruby on Rails instead of in kind of where that that thought came from, like he was always like, "Why? Like I <laughs> this is like I am not gonna touch this part of the code because I don't understand it, and you know nobody else is gonna understand it, um, and it's just like brittle, right? Because you you'll yeah. make changes when it's not kind of done in a straightforward way." Um, and you can often, like, if you have some experience with one framework, you you see it quite soon. Like, if you look at code that's not kind of following how that should be used. But it's yeah. sometimes hard to describe up front. Like, it's just like you see it and you feel like, ah, this is off. This is off. <laughs> um, and it, And it's hard to describe ahead of time. Or maybe I'm just not senior enough, like we talked about. Like, I need to be even more senior before I can describe it ahead of time. Yeah, I don't but, know. Yeah. I feel like any other interesting problems you've had? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I spent a lot of time debugging stuff last week. Apparently, um, the other interesting <laughs> issue we fixed on Friday as well was um, so. I think earlier this year we built we built a CSV import feature into into our product and it's one of the features that isn't released to the public yet but our customer support is using it a lot so whenever we have someone who asks for like can you please import my export from mailchimp into my um into my account and it's usually michael getting that file and then using that feature we built to import stuff and um a couple of times it has happened that we try to import something and the library we use to validate email addresses would just fail with like weird errors about like UTF-8 encoding and not matching regular expressions and basically failing to verify that an email address is correct and not just by saying it's incorrect, but by actually raising an exception and crashing basically. Um, and I, I, I was super confused about this because like all of user list processes uh, data as UTF-8 most of the tools we use these days default to UTF-8 and it didn't make a lot of sense. So why why would there be something weird inside an email address? I mean, it's an email address. It's It has some standards around it, I guess. Um, but we're running into issues over and over again. And uh, at first it was like, okay, maybe the, the data is just crap that we're getting. Like maybe there's errors in there and it's just like random email addresses. But it turns out this particular one was actually not an error it was a good email address um so the library we're using to um process files that we store in s3 
has a streaming mode that we're using. Uh, so instead of lo loading the entire file into memory and then processing it in one go, we're basically processing it, processing it in chunks so we don't like store the entire file on our servers, like or in, in memory actually. And it turns out in streaming mode, it's not properly setting the encoding of the data it's getting. So instead of getting the file as UTF-8, we were getting the file in ASCII 8-bit and therefore <laughs> Which is so, so much in use. The most used encoding. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, uh, and it took a while to figure this out because I feel like the, the hard part about encoding issues is like there is lim like a million places where this can go wrong. Like I think this particular customer exported this from custom.io, I guess. So maybe custom.io got the encoding wrong. Apparently they didn't. Um, then I think they uploaded it to Google Sheets. So there could be an encoding issue. Um, then we downloaded it from Google Sheets to our local file system. Downloading might be wrong. Then we uploaded it to S3 to process it. So uploading might be wrong, um, which also wasn't the case. And then the part that was broken was like downloading it from S3 into our memory. There was the issue. Um, and then, I mean, it could have been storing it in our database. Like all of these places are potentially causing encoding issues. So it's always... It's always a nightmare to debug because you, you're not you're not sure where to look for the problem. And um, I guess we just got lucky that this was my first hunch of where the problem might be because it's also the only or one of the only parts where we actually have control over it. So I guess we got lucky that it's actually something we could fix by just I think we had to 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 monkey patch the library to enforce the encoding. But now we're downloading the file as UTF eight. Everything's converting properly. Regex are matching again, and it's fixed now. But this was not a nice thing to figure out. <laughs> I can never like encoding, and I think dates. In it's just like I can never. I probably haven't spent enough time. Like I think if I spent some more time, like actually practicing, you know, like doing little katas aren't that what they're called like where you do little practice sessions where you mm -hmm. only work on that one problem then you know maybe it would stick but i feel like with encoding it's just uh, usually it works because the frameworks kind of all work together like at least the technologies i use but then when the problem arises it's so it's, it's not enough time so i like i feel like i start from scratch every time i'm like what yeah. like you know it's yeah. you know what are these different things and how do i actually check because sometimes you download the file you open it in a text editor and the text editor is smart enough to kind of like show you something that looks good and then you're like well it looks good but then somewhere in there it's got the encoding information and yeah i've had some like that's one of my my um blank blank spots i feel yeah in me, me too like i <laughs> i'm always sitting in front of it and be like okay like wh why what's the problem do i have to and i feel like what's also hard is that there are a lot of like sledgehammer solutions to encoding problems um and if you like get them wrong and put them into the wrong place you're just making things worse and i feel like also once you made it worse and you start like wrongly encoded stuff in your database it's like there's almost no chance you'll be able to clean it up in the future um so i'm always super careful about touching any of that parts and um i'd rather not <laughs> if given the choice i think that and and with dates also it's really hard like if you start storing wrong time zone data like it's really hard to kind of clean that up because yeah. You often lost the context of why did it get that time zone but it's just i thought like one of i guess youtube's kind of reasons it's become so successful it's that they just like handle video encoding because that is also just crazy like i remember i don't know when but like, like years ago when trying to be like playing just playing videos it's like what format is it in and like there were so many different kind of formats and I guess encodings and I don't even know what all these things are called and then YouTube came and you could just like upload it and then they would just stream it to you and it always worked and 
and people were yeah. like, I'm just going to upload my videos to YouTube and embed them on my site. And that's how they got to start tracking everyone. But um, <laughs> maybe because they just solved that hard problem for people and people are like, yes, <laughs> please yeah. take my, you know, yeah. or not take my money, just take my privacy. And then Vimeo came and you can actually pay and and they will do it and and not like have this the business model that youtube have but but there are some companies that like sole business purpose is because some of these things are just hard to do <laughs> and 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 you're just like uh this is not my core business i'm just gonna throw money at it and and not learn anymore about video encoding <laughs> yeah yeah totally but, yeah anyways but, I've yeah been talking that was a lot all of your about, issues yeah all of my issues <laughs> <laughs> all of your issues. issues but how are you doing benedict no um well it's been fun i think listening to you like re-talk through your your debugging you're really good at articulating your debugging journey which i think is helpful for others and you're probably your mentee as well if you talk about these things with with them um on my side, though, I was on vacation. Uh, I got to meet Miriam, as we talked about. And on vacation, I got to send that proposal I talked about where we're going to do prune your follows with like a little bit of a content. We're going to make it, deploy it, put it on Product Hunt, and also make a little bit of content around it. And I finished that in a bar in Heidelberg because I was walking around this <laughs> little town and I didn't see anywhere where people were on their laptops. And the person I traveled with, like she's she's 56. So I was like, where would people go to like work with laptop? And she's like, Germans don't do that. And I'm like, I don't really think that's true. Like, I think that's a generational thing, but okay. So I was walking around and I couldn't really find anything. And like time was running out. And I, I saw this little, I thought it was a cafe, it turned out to be a bar, and a guy was there with his laptop. And I was like, oh great, I'm gonna work here. And I took it, I think it took like an hour or two before I'm like, what is this smell? Like I'm feeling all nostalgic. Like what, what's happening? And they were smoking indoors. <laughs> what? It turns out if you don't serve food, they could smoke indoors. Like as long as they only serve alcohol or like drinks, I guess. Oh, also. interesting. Like yeah. non-alcohol. Um, but it like took me a really, cause it wasn't really that we were like five people in there, like all men and me, uh, which also, it just felt natural to me until I was like, well, this is like, <laughs> you know, a <laughs> little weird. <laughs> but that's that's what you get when you work in, in my field. Anyway, but but the nostalgic feeling was really weird. Like, I really did not, like, I did not have, like, a bad, like, oh, this is a bad smell. I just had, like, this is very nostalgic. Like, I felt like I was a student again. Like, and it was from the people smoking inside. So that was just, like, a, like, fun little um, experience I had abroad. <laughs> um and then we are finalizing that deal hopefully today so maybe next week i'll be able to tell you even more about it Ooh. so that's super exciting yes yeah and that's why i was like hopeful i'm very hopeful i don't know if i'm not even like i'm more than hopeful like i really think this is gonna like become something or like it's gonna happen but you know i don't want to jinx it either like maybe it doesn't <laughs> anyway um and in addition to that even before the vacation and then while I was on vacation, like we have been doing um, a lot of work on the Cloudinary plugins. We are kind of finishing off all of the tasks that we've promised to do. And I um, really feel that like Ula is really coming into his own as a developer and also just he's now working on the readmes um, and something I really don't like that I feel like that's a hard problem to work on documentation not not my best but he's doing a really good job on the on the readmes and like he's you know bringing some extra joy to them with little emojis and and stuff like that and i guess like i appreciate those things when i see it and i do like that it's more like fun and joyful but when i'm tasked with doing this doing it there's like there's no joy <laughs> like my <laughs> documentation is just like no <laughs> like no joy it's just like the most boring I could ever do it. So I think if, uh, you know, he does like one go through and like puts in a lot of flair and then I go through and just make sure that everything is correct and kind of, you know, do that part. I think together, like this is actually like working really, it's really well. Mix. So it's a good mix. It's absolutely a good mix. But it's sometimes, you know, we, we've had to find a way to like, you know, work with our different styles, both when it comes to coding and, you know, documentation and, and everything else. But yeah. And he also done like quite a lot of coding on, um, 
as well on this this section because there's been a lot of cleanup. So um, he's been able to go in and like delete a lot of code, and I because we already had tests in place, so I could like easily check that things were working. And um, and yeah, and I think he's enjoyed himself really. It's it's much more fun working on a real project, right, than just like doing tutorials and and stuff like that, or even just personal projects. So so that's been fun. And then uh, on my schedule this week is the talk, 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 because I'm going to do a rehearsal on a stage on Friday with a little group of people who's been working on totally different kinds of presentation. But I wanted to be able to like stand on a stage again and test out how that is so walking back and forth and like doing all of those things that you do when, when you're on stage and not just looking into a camera, sitting down yeah. at your computer. So I think I'm going to fail kind of miserably on Friday, but that's kind of what I'm hoping for that I like, I actually do like a solid try now to get it done in like three days. And then I get up there and like, I go through it as much as I can. And I still have like three weeks till the actual talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because then, and then hopefully like I've you know managed to be done before I leave so I can enjoy San Francisco when I go. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, let's. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Uh, will you be recording yourself Absolutely. doing doing that exercise run? I think maybe I'll ask her to do that because I think the people who's going to be there they're not going to be like super helpful content wise because they they don't really know what I'm talking about. So I think I'm just going to ask her to to um, the person organizing to to record me with with my phone so that I have it and then I could like send it to some people. If I don't fail completely, I'll send it to some people for some feedback on the on the actual content as well. I guess it might so. actually be a good thing that they are not super familiar with the content or even don't know anything about the content because that allows them to pay attention to everything else, right? Yeah, and also see if like if the I mean if it's interesting enough for somebody that don't understand the content, like if I can keep kind of the energy up and 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 like with the walking and like the pre like stage presence, like if I can keep them kind of engaged without them understanding everything, then that's a win. Because um, there's always going to be somebody at a conference like that, you know, there's going to yeah. be so many people and everybody's going to be, most people are going to be developers, I guess, but but they can be in a very broad range. So maybe like a third of the audience don't really have any kind of connection to what I'm talking about at all. So yeah. Um, but also getting a little nervous now because I have to actually <laughs> like finish it and get up there and and do it. But I am but that it's gonna be very beneficial. So looking forward to that. Um yeah. And that's it for me really. Cool. Yeah. And keep on taking vacations. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Good on you. Yeah, but now like I want to work. Like I we always say that in Norway that this like fall vacation it comes way too fast. Like you're just done with the summer vacation and then fall vacation kind of comes very soon after. Mm -hmm. And it's because of you know the kids were supposed to go back to their farms and help the the their their parents pick potatoes really. It was used to called be called the potato vacation. <laughs> um and that's why it's so early, because I think if you just sat down with a school schedule, you would be like, you know, do it maybe at least end of October, yeah, <laughs> not beginning of October. Uh, but then I guess it would be too late for the poor potatoes. So <laughs> that's why the vacation comes so so soon upon us after the, the summer holiday. Makes sense. Mm. Cool. But feel better. <laughs> I hope Thanks. you are... All well by next week. We're gonna have next week. We're having Jeff from Outsera on as a guest, so that's gonna be super interesting because they also do email. I don't know if you you've looked oh, that up, I but they realized. also do email marketing as part of their service. So you can all mm. talk encryption and well, he's not the tech guy though. So, <laughs> but yeah, but, um, and probably some overlapping knowledge there at least. Yeah, that would be. And until then. Yep. And until then, see you around the interwebs. Bye. Bye.